Hello, and good evening, or good morning, or good afternoon, or good whatever time of night or day it happens to be wherever you happen to be. Welcome to Republic News. I am your hostess, Liviana. Many of my viewers will be familiar with the terms solidarity and intersectionality, although some may not know the meaning of one or the other or both of these terms, or have only a vague understanding. Those who are among the earliest members of my generation, such as myself, will almost certainly remember the Polish labor union named Solidarność, led by Lech Walesa, who would go on to become president of Poland in December of 1990. Many of my fellow leftists will be at least somewhat familiar with the song Solidarity Forever, which is sung to the tune of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. The first verse and the chorus are as follows. Now, I would sing this, but I don't think I'm up to it at the moment. Still having a lot of allergy uh, stuff going on. So, I'm just going to recite. When the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one, but the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever, for the union makes us strong. So, what exactly is this thing after which labor unions are named and, and about which labor union members sing? This, this solidarity thing. What is solidarity exactly? That's actually a very good question because the term has different but related meanings in various fields ranging from sociology and cultural anthropology in social science departments to theology and philosophy in liberal arts departments as well as in practical applications such as labor union strikes and activism. There are also various socialist political parties calling themselves solidarity or, or using the word as a part of the name of the party. Adding to the confusion is the use of the term by so-called third-way movements like fascism and neoliberalism, which pretend to be somehow centrist, but which are actually extreme far-right economic perspectives rather than centrist as they pretend. <clears throat> This is, of course, not at all what I'm talking about here. On the contrary, I'm speaking of a sort of cooperation, mutual aid, and mutual support on interpersonal and community levels based on common interests and goals, a cooperation which approaches a sense of unity and implies standing together against a common foe and or in support of getting common needs met, such as by collective bargaining power in a labor union, or such as a business of the type known as a cooperative. The key idea to remember here is standing together and cooperating in common interests and goals. So then, what is this thing called intersectionality? That's an even better question, <laughs> because the idea does not seem to be the reality. Uh, intersectionality in an academic setting sounds like a good way to address oppression, but in practice it tends to become its own form of oppression. To be more precise, it turns the oppressed into the oppressors and the oppressors into the oppressed. It's just turning the entire thing on its head, rather than getting rid of the systems and structures of oppression. And why does it do that? The answer is really quite simple, but before we get to that, we're going to have to define intersectionality in academic terms. Once that's done, we can look at what it becomes when it leaves the ivy-covered halls and goes out into the streets. So, according to the abstract for the chapter on intersectionality by Brittany Cooper in the Oxford Handbook of Feminist Theory, edited by Dish and Hawksworth, intersectionality is, quote, the key analytic framework through which feminist scholars in various fields talk about the structural identities of race, class, gender, and sexuality, end quote. Well then... 
We've already got the simple answer to which I referred in this brief quote. But let's look into this idea in a bit more detail before I make that answer explicit. <clears throat> I, I prefer to avoid being accused of uh, giving a critique based on a superficial understanding of the term, so I believe I need to make plain that I do know more about the idea than just that brief summary statement. The person who coined the term intersectionality was Kimberly Crenshaw, who gave the keynote address on intersectionality at the Women of the World, or WOW, conference in March of 2016. In this address, Ms. Crenshaw states, among other things, that in her original article, quote, intersectionality was meant to draw attention to the way that black women's experience, sometimes distinct experience of gender discrimination, was buried under the experiences of white women and black women's sometimes distinct experiences of race was buried under the experiences of African-American men, end quote. Again, so as to make plain that this is not being taken out of context, this statement was about how intersectionality was meant to be taken in that original article, which she wrote back in 1989, about anti-discrimination law. I'm going to quote a bit more from her keynote address to make something plain about the understanding she, the originator of the idea of intersectionality, uh, uh, has and, and how it differs from how the concept is applied in practice. But before I do so, let me refer back to the abstract from Ms. Cooper's chapter on intersectionality. Remember, the abstract says that intersectionality is an analytic framework for talking about, quote, structural identities of race, class, gender, and sexual identity and sexuality. Notice, uh, end quote, notice structural identities. Now, Ms. Crenshaw goes on in her keynote address to say, quote, A lot of people, particularly those who haven't followed demarginalizing from its initial iteration, often mistakenly think that intersectionality is, about, is only about multiple identities, end quote. She goes on to state, quote, That's not at least my articulation of intersectionality. Intersectionality is not primarily about identity. It's about how structures make certain identities the consequence of the vehicle for vulnerability. So if you want to know how many intersections matter, you've got to look at the context. What's happening? What kind of discrimination is going on? What are the policies? What are the institutional structures that play a role in contributing to the exclusion of some people and not others? End quote. She also says that there are multiple forms of intersectionality. Her address is very interesting and informative. It's not that long, and I will include a link to the video thereof in the description for this present video. For the moment, I'll only add a bit of summary of her main point, or what seems to me to be the main point, in the address, which is that we should not focus on the concerns and needs of a single identity while excluding all other identities in the same context of structures, but rather we should take all of them into account where they intersect. <laughs> ah, these allergies. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so I don't have much of any issue with Ms. Crenshaw's articulation of intersectionality, but this, it seems to me, is more the high-minded ideal found in academic settings. This seeks to include everyone and not simply whomever may be judged to be the most marginalized at the moment. No winner of the oppression Olympics or the victim Olympics or whatever you want to call that. Uh, looking at how this is applied outside the halls of academia, especially among those outrage mongers inspired by post-structuralism, that's an important term there, post-structuralism, and post-modernism, we don't see any acknowledgement of structures of oppression, which is what Ms. Crenshaw is talking about. 
At most, we get some vague references to systemic this and institutional that, but the focus is still on various identities, fractured into their several little interest groups, marked by distrust of other various identities, which may have benefited from structures of domination and oppression on the grounds that those benefits have biased those other identities to have a vested interest in maintaining those structures. As a consequence, the various identities may adopt a, a separatist mindset, which eventually devolves into entirely subjective and individual perceptions of relationships in connection with power and domination. While post-structuralism and uh, while post-structuralism may have rejected identity politics, the current crop of outrage mongers have absolutely embraced it. At the same time, post-structuralism, with its nominalist metaphysic, advocated for a hyper-relativistic epistemology, uh, which these same outrage mongers have certainly employed in their efforts to spread their outrage and promote their narratives of victimhood. Words are subjected to semantic revisionism so that they become both broader and narrower in meaning. Racism has been altered by these outrage mongers from the strict view of hatred based on ethnic discrimination to, to a both broader and narrower understanding of hatred based on ethnic discrimination and coupled with power. The same semantic revisionism has been applied to the word sexism, which, according to the outrage mongers, cannot exist in a person unless that person be in some position of power or privilege over those whom he or she hates by virtue of their sex. Last year, a certain... Um, supposed journalist wrote an article in which he applied a similar semantic revisionism to the term white supremacy in such a way as to expand its meaning while simultaneously limiting it so that he could claim essentially that any white person, whatever that might be, is somehow a white supremacist because all such persons allegedly benefit from white supremacy and therefore, in his view, must have some vested interest in perpetuating it. Looking back again at the abstract of Ms. Cooper's chapter on intersectionality, we see the focus is not on the structures of marginalization and oppression, but rather on the identities themselves. As it says, quote, the structural identities of race, class, gender, and sexuality. This, uh, end quote, this shift in focus from the structures to the identities is not the only issue here. The simple answer is right there in that quote. Which things are given as categories of identity? Race, class, gender, and sexuality. To these, some will add ability and disability, but the multiplication of identities is not what I'm talking about here as an issue. No, I'm seeing one word there which should not be there because it is far more than an identity, and it is, in fact, what should be the central focus of all these various identities in dismantling structures of oppression and marginalization and disenfranchisement and so forth. I refer to the word class. What happened to the Occupy movement? You know, Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Boston, Occupy Houston, Occupy this, Occupy that. What happened to Occupy? What happened to that movement? I mean, it's still around, but you don't hear so much about it anymore. When it started, it was everyone of every ethnicity and sex and gender identity, the able and the disabled alike, white, black, Hispanic, Native American, Jewish, Arabic, Asian, Aboriginal, European, male, female, cisgender, transsexual, uh, intersex, everyone, the representation, the, repre the representatives of the 99% coming together in solidarity to stand up to the 1% represented by Wall Street. And then it fell apart. The various identities began to fracture into separatist groups, each intent on securing their own scraps from the table of the 1% and let everyone else be damned. A movement of such promise, a movement built on class struggle, on solidarity, splintered into smaller groups which saw the other groups not as comrades, but as rivals. 
Was this an organic division, or was there some kind of COINTELPRO-like operation organized by someone in government or in the corporate sector or perhaps even some political party or would-be candidate which fomented this division? It would not be out of character for the government to have run such a divide-and-conquer operation. The FBI's COINTELPRO, or counterintelligence program, is known to have undertaken such actions during the 1960s in order to render powerless such movements as the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the hippie movement, and so on. In some cases, they were more successful than others. Among their tactics were efforts to foment distrust within the ranks, to cast suspicion on various personalities within the movements, to encourage inter- internecine squabbles, to smear the reputation of this or that leader, attributing the division within the Occupy movement to some kind of government-backed counterintelligence operation would not necessarily be paranoia. However, all of these tactics have become public knowledge and have been utilized by corporate interests, political operatives, and even online trolls. And without evidence to pin the op on one or another of such suspects, no conclusion is supported as to which, if any of them, might have been responsible. It might not have been an op at all. The division could, after all, have been purely organic. That is to say, it could have arisen somewhat spontaneously from within the movement. However, I doubt this. Uh, The result of the division was to render the Occupy movement almost entirely powerless to effect any sort of reform or revolutionary change, and certain groups most certainly benefited from that, namely all of the groups I have listed, government, corporate interests, political operatives, even political candidates. If I were a gambling woman, I'd put my money on one or more of these interests and not on an organic splintering, but that's mere suspicion. At any rate, what could have been a transformative movement was rendered largely impotent, and this is the chief issue with intersectionality in practice. It takes focus away from the primary struggle and divides us into squabbling rivals. The phrase I used above in referring to a suspected operation, that is, divide and conquer, is divide et impera in Latin, and is also expressed as divide ut regnes, which is Latin for divide in order that you may rule. The duopoly of the two-party system, the corporate oligarchy, the military-industrial complex, these do not need to conquer us. But if they seek to perpetuate their rule over us, they are served in that goal by keeping us divided. For you see, the working class, cisgender, heterosexual, white male, has far more in common with the working class, black, intersex to female, transsexual, than either has with a person wealthy enough to own a private island off the coast of a Central American nation and two large estates in Texas, as well as oil fields and oil pipelines throughout the United States. Uh, The poor cisgender lesbian Hispanic woman has far more in common with the poor cisgender heterosexual white man than either does with the CEO of the largest bank of the United States, in the United States. More, the cisgender Hispanic gay man in his 20s with a job has far more in common with a disabled transsexual straight Jewish woman than either does with a former first lady of the United States. We who are the 99% must wake up and realize that the various identities will never have their needs and concerns addressed permanently until we change the system in economic terms to bring about economic justice so that nobody is starving or in danger of losing their home or unable to afford uh, necessary medical procedures or medications or cannot afford an education without going into a modern form of indentured servitude. We must recognize that we who are the 99% have more in common than we have different. We must address the corruption in government and politics. We must jail the criminal robber barons and the modern incarnations of Boss Tweed, who usurp our democracy and our democratic institutions.
We must dismantle the slave plantations known as prisons and the companies which promise to cover our health care costs while profiting from not actually paying our health care bills in a legalized form of, of a protection racket, essentially. We must finally stand together in solidarity and stop fighting each other over largely superficial differences of some supposed identity, and only then will we be able to restore not only justice to our nation, but our nation itself, the Democratic Federal Republic, which was established by the Constitution and which has been turned into a dystopian nightmare of legalized corruption, theft, and exploitation. This... This is our cause, not securing scraps from the table of the corporate oligarchy for a season for one particular identity or intersection of identities. We shall all fall separately at the intersections of our various identities, or we shall stand together in solidarity and restore our democratic federal republic and the rule of law applied equally to all. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe and click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to be notified of all new content. Please also consider sharing the video on your social media. I have a Discord server for my subscribers which is called Lives Livestreams and Vids and you may find the link in the video description if you'd like to join. If you like what I do here on YouTube and or at the Progressive Flame, please consider becoming my patron through Patreon. The link for my Patreon is in the video description. Until next time, have fun, but stay safe. For Republic News, this is Liviana, signing off.